A new era at Boise State started on July 1st, the Dr. Marlene Tromp era. She became the university's seventh president and the first woman to hold the position. The State Board of Education named Dr. Trump president at a time of remarkable growth on campus, both in the number of students and new buildings. It's also a time when the cost to go to college is growing. Today, where she's been, what brought her here, and where she plans to take Boise State. President Marlene Tromp's vision for the university, ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Dr. Marlene Trump, a first generation college graduate, is now the head of Idaho's largest university, Boise State. Today I'll talk with the new president about what attracted her to the job, what she sees for Boise State's present and future, and her passion for writing and Victorian history. Get this, she's working on a book about unsolved murders from the 1800s. But first things first, Dr. Trump comes to Boise State from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she launched faculty development initiatives, new support programs for staff, and led community in the creation of a new strategic academic plan. She was also the Dean of Arizona State University's new Interdisciplinary College of Arts and Sciences and the Vice Provost of the University's West Campus. So Dr. Trump, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. I'm so pleased to be here. Well, two plus months on the job. How's it going? I've never been happier. I think it's an amazing place. It's an extraordinary faculty, a dedicated staff, an incredible student body, and I love Idaho and Boise. So what has been your focus in these first several weeks as you, you hit the ground running, but you know, what has really been your focus as you've gotten started with your tenure? Really learning everything that I can and learning deeply about the community. So that was the reason that I toured the state when I first arrived. Um, it's the reason that I've been meeting with all the colleges and I have um, meetings scheduled with each group that are more sustained to have some dialogue with them. Um, I'm reading just huge stacks of materials and just really trying to get to know the community, um, know the concerns, know the issues, know the challenges. Because before I'm making big decisions, I really want to feel like I understand deeply the place. So who were you meeting with on the, the statewide tour? Um, I met with legislators. I met with um, community members who were deeply engaged and involved and I got to you know just meet a lot of people who lived in those communities it was wonderful and learn all about the state along the way yes yes so I you know I grew up in Wyoming and so I spent a lot of time camping all around mm -hmm. the West um, that was one of the big recreations that we had when I was growing up so I'd been in Idaho before to camp but it's a lot different now than it was 30 years ago. Oh, no doubt about it. Um, we have some video to show of you on moving in day um, on campus <laughs> uh, when you were out there helping students uh, move into the dorms and um, you know, running around giving high fives and we're showing that now <laughs> this was posted on Twitter. Why was it important for you to get out there and do that? I, I want people to feel that I'm accessible. It's actually one of the reasons I have a social media presence. A lot of people feel like a university president is so far out of their reach, there's not an opportunity to communicate or connect with that person. And because I didn't come from inside the community, I wanted people to get to know a little bit about who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so being present on move-in day gives me a chance to welcome and greet that incoming class and show the excitement that I have for them. It's, I think orientation is the second best day of the year next to graduation. And you've certainly shown that excitement too at Boise State games um, in, t in terms of getting out there and, and connecting with people. Yeah, and, and you know, things like the Garth Brooks concert, it was so fun to host that right after I arrived and, and, and getting to see all of our student athletes, but also getting to learn more about our academic programs and, and more about what our students are doing, the kinds of incredible things our students are doing. Um, think back, when was the first time in your life that you heard about Boise State? It might have been a football reference, you know, I think that's often how people first encounter us. Um, but when I was in high school, people were talking about going to school in college, so it may have been, going to school in Idaho, so it may have been that they, there were people who came to college up here who I went to school with. Um, lots of folks came to Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, Boise State's reputation as a research university, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later um, academically. Of course, the blue field has been famous for more than 30 years. Um, but what attracted you here? Why did you say yes when you were offered this job? 
I, that's a great question, and it's an easy one for me to answer. Um, I was so excited about what I saw here as an openness and willingness to think about how to do things better and differently. And a lot of universities have, you know, this storied history and past, and they're and they feel really comfortable doing what they've done for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there is an enormous value in the work that we've been doing for hundreds of years, but if we're not thinking differently about how we serve our students now and how we serve our communities now, then we haven't grown. And right now, the students we're teaching have grown up with computers in their hands. They've had computers their entire lives. That's different than I was when, you know, things were than when I was a student. And so if we're teaching the same, same way, if we're, delivering education in the same way, if we're doing service in the same ways we've always done, we must be underserving. And here at Boise State, I saw this incredible enthusiasm. How can we do it better? What can we do differently? How can we do things in ways that are really transformative for our students, for the community? And to me, that's a real thrill. So what is your, in a nutshell, if you can, your vision for the university? What's your priority beyond you know, these first few months of, of really learning about everything. Beyond that, what's your priority? National leadership. And I think it's possible for Boise State to supply that because I think we have the ingredients to show people how to move forward in a number of areas. We've already been so innovative. We've just moved up several points in the national ranking for innovative universities. Um, so this is alongside the likes of Stanford and MIT. We've moved up in those rankings again this year. So we've been in the top 50. Now we're moving up even higher in those rankings. And that tells you something about the way in which we're approaching what it means to be a university. And so I really do believe we're already demonstrating national leadership and the potential for that is even greater down the road. And um, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing Boise State or even just higher education overall? I think um, you mentioned one of those things at the opening, which is that education costs have risen, and that's in direct proportion to the ways in which states nationally have reduced their investment in higher education as there have been more and more demands on their budgets in other ways. They've reduced their investment in higher education, and you can just chart this change nationally, that as, as that disinvestment has occur occurred by states, there has been an increase in the burdens placed on students, and it hasn't gotten any cheaper to deliver an education. You know, when I went to school, I came into class with a notebook and a pen or pencil. Now students have technology, and we have to supply that technology in the classroom, or we're not preparing them to go out and work in the world. So what we do has become, in some ways, much more costly. And so we have a responsibility to really think about how we can be efficient and thoughtful about how we do our work so that we can reduce costs. And we need to look for a lot of other kinds of support to come into the university so we can try to reduce the costs for our students. But it is a real burden and a real responsibility. You mentioned in your State of the University address about focusing on fundraising. Yes. Is that right away? Absolutely, I think, and I think that should always be a part of what happens. Now, state universities historically didn't have to think much about fundraising. It was all the privates who did development and advancement work. And it was the publics who just relied on income from the state. Well, that's really changed in the last couple of decades. And, and so universities need to be thinking about how they can find those partners who are passionate about what we do. And what we do is we change people's lives so they can change the world. That's a pretty amazing mission. So there are a lot of people and organizations that are willing to support that mission, but we've got to go out there and find those right matches. And be able to use that money then to keep tuition and fees low? Well, certainly to supply, what, what we can do often is use that to supply needs that are, that are being met right now by those state fundings, and then, then really try to use that to provide scholarship funds. For example, my investiture, which will be in early October, um, we're having a dinner event for that, a dinner gala, but the idea behind that dinner gala is to raise money for our True Blue Scholarship to make sure that we're really increasing those scholarship funds so that as the real cost of educating students increases, we're helping students um, to cover those costs by giving them scholarship funds. But we're also one of the most efficiently delivered educations in the country at Boise State right now. 
Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit. It's mm -hmm. been um, very well documented that 28 Idaho Republican lawmakers sent a letter to Boise State University just after you took office um, calling the school's efforts to create inclusivity, diversity, and equality disconcerting. Um, the lawmakers said the programs add unnecessary costs and that BSU officials should focus on academic excellence. Now, because of that letter, do you plan to make any changes to those programs they were talking about? Well, here's been my plan. My plan has been to really meet with those folks and understand what at bottom were their concerns. And often when we educated them about programs, like for example, there were a number of people who believed that we were actually having separate commencement ceremonies for our African-American students and our white students. And that was very disconcerting to people. That's not in fact what's happening. There are celebrations and people, veterans have a celebration. Our, our students with different religious backgrounds have celebrations. There are many, many of these celebrations and they've always been called graduations, although there's only one commencement ceremony. So is it more like a, a reception afterward? It's It's a party, you know? People mm -hmm. have these special parties and and, and they, do, they do activities at those parties that are different, but there's a singular university graduation ceremony, commencement ceremony. Sure. And, and a part of what I've told people often is, letting people feel a sense of community helps them to feel a part of the whole too. So if you can find folks who you, know, you feel like you connect with in whatever way you connect, then that gives you a chance to feel more a part of the whole. And so th some of it was helping people understand, you know, exactly what we were doing in those things. But also, um, we've really heard a lot from the business community about something that research has shown us for a long time, that the more diverse a community is, the better kinds of solutions it produces. We've got lots of evidence that shows the more diverse a team is, um, whether that's in science or business, the better the outcomes are that they have because they're thinking in many, many different ways. And that diversity is, of course, quite broad when we're talking about a diverse team. But we want to support all of our students. We shouldn't eliminate programs that support our students. We should be looking for all the ways in which we can support our students. And you expect that conversation to continue? Absolutely. Probably forever. I mean, it's going to be a very important how we all get along. That's right. And I do think, too, that um, there were some mistaken notions about how those programs were funded and supported. Many of these are student-generated programs, and we want to support those student efforts. When, when students come together and say, here's a way in which we need support in order to thrive here, we want them to have that opportunity. All right. We're going to pause right here for just a moment, Dr. Trump, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about research, innovation, and the concept of blue turf thinking. Waiting for the right moment to sign up for St. Luke's Fit One? Then step on up and register today. Pick up the pace and run your race. Walk, run, or stroll in the 5K, 10K, or half marathon on Saturday, September 28th. And don't forget, our junior runners, kids 12 and under, are free with a paid adult. For more information, go to ktvb.com community. You're gonna get through this. We're here. So the victim can be heard. TV's longest running primetime drama returns with an explosive ripped from the headlines case. Sorry to keep you waiting, darling. Ian McShane guest stars. You want this power, don't you? <laughs> I don't know what kind of hooks he has. He's not getting away with this. The 21st season of SVU begins September 26th on NBC. Attention crafters, the architectural design community is giving away free samples of design items on September 28th at the Zero Landfill event sponsored by the International Interior Design Association. Samples include carpet, tile, fabric, wood, brick, glass, and more. Giving it away keeps it out of the landfill and into the hands of crafters and artists to reuse for their own projects. To post your local event, visit the Idaho events calendar at ktvb.com. Action. 
And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. My guest today is Boise State's seventh president, Dr. Marlene Trump. And Dr. Trump, I've heard you talk um, several times and mention the term you know, blue turf thinking or blue field thinking um, when it applies to Boise State. What do you mean by that? Well, as you know, um, we have been nationally ranked in innovation for the last few years, and we've just moved up in that ranking. And really what's been happening on our football field, and the whole concept behind that blue turf is, how do we show people that we think differently, that we're scrappy and creative and innovative, and that we're doing things differently? And that's how we've often been able to win when we're facing off against programs that have far superior financial backing because we're, you know, we don't have that same kind of financial powerhouse mm -hmm. behind our athletics programs and they still do these amazing things. So I think that is something, what a lot of people don't know until they get to know us better, is that's something that's true in our academic programs. It's what our staff do every day. It's what our faculty are doing all the time. It's how our students are engaging. So on limited resources, in, in an environment where there are so many challenges, they're doing these incredible things and they're doing them by thinking creatively and innovatively about how we can work around those challenges and using the challenges actually to accelerate what they do. So I think it's something that really permeates the whole university and it's exciting to me. I, I think you should trademark that and then we can get rid of the phrase thinking outside the box and we'll just call it blue turf Excellent. thinking. Excellent. Excellent idea. Because that one's kind of tired anyway. We'll get t-shirts. There you go, <laughs> TM on the side, it's all set. Money will go to scholarships. Excellent idea. Okay. Um, in your State of the University address, you do talk a lot about um, innovation, creativity, interdisciplinary thinking as well. Why are those so important um, on a university campus of today? I think as we look at the way universities have evolved, um, there's a way in which so many of the structures in universities, and I'll get a little bit technical with you here, when you're in a particular academic department, in order to get tenure, you have to publish with journals that are known in your field. You have to have your work recognizable to reviewers who are in your field of study. And the journals that are the oldest and the most established are the ones that have really strict boundaries around what they do. So if you're doing interdisciplinary or innovative work, you might fall outside of those boundaries, not be recognizable and not get tenure. Mm. And so there were incentives in universities, there have been incentives for many years that discouraged people working across those disciplinary lines. And that wasn't the intent of those structures, it was a consequence of the way that those yeah. structures grew up. And as a result, very often, especially more established universities, it's really hard to scale the walls between disciplines because people need to publish in the very best and oldest journals, which are very disciplinary in their structure. And so it's, it takes risk taking to be willing to cross those lines. But more and more young people who are graduating with their PhDs and becoming faculty in universities are interested in the real problem solving that universities can do for communities and for the world. Mm -hmm. And in order to solve a problem, for example, like water shortage, how do you do that with just one discipline? You've got to have biologists, you've got to have sociologists, you've got to have environmental studies people, you've got to have folks from across the academic spectrum who can think through those complex issues and you better have folks who are philosophers thinking through those mm -hmm. things too because there are some big long-term implications. So to be a university that's willing to take the risks to think across those lines changes the way you answer those questions. Mm -hmm. If you're just asking the biologists to solve a problem like water shortages, then you're only going to get a certain kind of answer. But if you start asking with a team of people yeah. who are thinking across the spectrum, you're going to get really different answers. And those answers are probably going to be more meaningful. So the more we can work across those boundaries, the more innovative we can be and the more creative we can be in solving real problems. And if universities aren't just educating people but we're in the business of genuinely serving the communities that we live in. So one of Dr. Kustra, the former Boise State president, mm -hmm. of course, one of his big focuses was growing Boise State um, into a nationally renowned research institution. Um, with a lot of investment in new colleges and buildings and the reputation and the ranking has risen. How important is it in this day and age for a university, for Boise State, of course, specifically, 
to be recognized as a research university. I'll tell you what's important about research, and a lot of times people don't understand this. Research, people think of research as almost a faculty indulgence sometimes, mm -hmm. like, oh, faculty indulge themselves by doing, themselves by doing their research. Um, actually, research is one of the most powerful ways we can teach students and prepare them for the world after graduation. If someone is engaged in a research project with a faculty member, and it doesn't matter what the field is, whether that person is an artist, a humanist, a social scientist, a business professor, it doesn't matter what that person's field is. If a student is engaged actively in research, they're beginning to see the ways in which you apply what you're learning as a part of your college education to doing transformative work. And that's what we need people to be ready to do when they graduate. So for example, I did a research study when I was at ASU, and what we found is that students who were engaged in that research, even if they were, as they came into college, the least prepared, so if we compared them to their peers who didn't engage in that research and they were among the least prepared, those least prepared students might have a 45% graduation rate. When we put them in those research experiences, it almost sounds like I'm making this number up when I say it. We had a 99% graduation rate for those students. Wow. And so we know it helps them see the value of what they're doing. It helps them understand where they're going. It helps them see how, you know, instead of taking a class and saying, I don't know why I'm taking this class, they begin to see the connection between all of the work that they're doing. So I think research is really a powerful teaching tool. So it's not only serving people with your outcomes, when you do cancer research and you find a new treatment protocol, people understand that connection. Mm -hmm. We're also doing research that's preparing people to serve the world better. We're gonna take another time out and um, come right back with one more segment with Dr. Trump. So um, seances, freak shows, and an unsolved Victorian era murder. What do those things have to do with Dr. Trump? Find out next on Viewpoint. For a limited time, hurry into Arctic Circle to try an above-the-rim chocolate done-for-donut shake or enjoy a delicious Denali Original Moose Tracks shake. Arctic Circle, where the good stuff is. All your hopes, all your dreams are closer than they seem. All you are, your desires. Two explosive offenses, two ravenous front sevens, two unflappable leaders, Eagles, Falcons, all eyes on Sunday Night Football. In 11 seasons, only one person has ever won. Monday, it will happen again. He's got it! A million dollars in the title of American Ninja Warrior! Step into a healthier tomorrow with St. Luke's Fit One Healthy Living Expo, September 26th and 27th at Jump. Admission is free and open to the public. A great way to get you pointed in a healthier direction with cooking demonstrations, wellness tips, and activities the whole family can enjoy. Plus, pick up your race packet or register to walk or run at this year's Fit One. For more information, visit ktvb.com community. premieres September 23rd on NBC. And welcome back once again. My guest today is new Boise State President Dr. Marlene Trump. By the way, her doctoral dissertation was on Victorian novels and the new laws being written then on domestic violence. So Dr. Trump, why are you so interested in the Victorian era in England? I really think when we look at the 19th century, we're better critics of our own moment. Our defenses come down, you know, when we can look rationally at a period that's close enough that we can recognize it, but far enough away that it doesn't put our defenses up where we don't have our dukes up to say, oh, but that's not what that means. We're actually just better critics of that moment and then we become better critics of ours. And of course, during that time, seances, freak shows were, were big, they were popular, it was entertainment in some ways, and people really believed in it, of course, on the seance side. What attracted you to write about those? You have books on those. Yes. 
Um, I have been interested my whole career on what I call marginal culture. So what's on the edges of society that we understand as being normative? What's on the edges of, of that and how does that help us understand what's in the center? And the idea, uh, what, did, what fascinated you most about seances? You were talking to me in the break about your approach to it and not looking at every practitioner as a quack. Yes, so what I was interested in was or asking- a, Or a con person. Right, yeah. right. What I was interested in asking the, the question was, if we approach this assuming everybody has gone into it as an intentional fraud, I'm gonna to try to pull the wool over on these people's eyes and, and really you know, make some money out of this. If you assume people have bad motives, you come to different conclusions than if you say, what if these people were earnestly trying to understand the world around them? And, and I'm not gonna pass judgment. It's certainly there were some people who were engaging in fraudulent behavior, but there were some people who deeply and profoundly believed. I've read their diaries. Mm -hmm. You know, and there were these wrenching, heartfelt struggles over what they were experiencing. And you're also wrapping up, basically, a book about unsolved murders in the Victorian era. Or belatedly solved. How's belatedly solved? How does, what's the focus there? I'm, I'm really interested in what happens in investigation and adjudication that makes some cases more difficult to solve than others. So, for example, I have one case in which a woman, the only female Jack the Ripper suspect, was accused of murder, but only belatedly did people discover she was actually one of the people who identified the body of the victim. She went with the family to identify the body of the victim. And she was only belatedly discovered to have been the murderer, even though her kitchen was just coated in blood. She was the murderer. Absolutely. And this is one of the cases that you and a colleague solved? Or That's not solve? the one that we solved. We solved one about a, a woman who um, murdered an old man that she lived with, a servant who murdered an old man that she lived with. And, and we were able to discover based on using um, contemporary forensic techniques how the murder occurred. So how, uh, we only have a few seconds left. When do you think the book might come out that people would be able to dive into it? Well, it depends on how long it takes me to get a little um, breathing room to do some final revisions. Are you busy I, right now? I'm kind of busy right now, and I think my focus is going to be Boise State. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the time you spent with us today and getting to know you a little bit better, your vision for the university, but also just a little bit about what drives you, too. I appreciate the time and, and your openness. Thank you, Doug. I hope to do it again sometime soon. Update you once, update our viewers once in a while what's going on in Boise State. Thank you so much. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. Have a great day.